Thank you very much, uh, Rena. Thank you very much for coming here this snowy white night. Well, let's uh, start somewhere. That's always the que that's always the question. Where do things start? We're always worried about where things went. We're always worried about where things go. Did we ever remember where things started? That's always important as an artist. It may be important as a human being also. Where did you start? Did you start before you came to your mother? Did you start inside your mother? Where do, these, where do your memories stop? Where did your photography begin? That's an important place to start. Where did your photography begin? So let's start with me. But it's not really where I started. It's when I started to take the picture. But it started long before then. I started taking pictures in the late 60s, officially. I was taking a camera, I was going from here to there, as a young man might. And I always tell people, and students especially, they want to know where to go, how to take pictures. There's usually only one answer I can give them. The only real way of learning about this business is to go out and take pictures. Somewhere along the line, perhaps, somewhere along the line, you might find a road that leads this way. And that road may take you to a place that you think you like. And or maybe a stop sign there. And you have to turn around and try to another, find another path. See, it's about finding the path, you see. It's about finding the shadow. It's about finding the other place. It's about finding the unexpected. It's about finding a place of the secret. That's what you have to start looking for. So this was the beginning of the journey, I guess, somewhere in the late 60s. This is in Coney Island in New York. And see the wire here. The shadow. The object. What's reality? What's illusion? What's the shadow? Where does one take over? Where does the other split apart? This was again the late 60s in America. Sort of a civil rights type of photograph. In 1973, I began a trip. This was a real trip. This was a real journey. It was a very spontaneous one. It lasted five years. I hitchhiked from Cairo to Cape Town and then made a trip from Istanbul to New Guinea, all by land. You know, when you look back upon things, the past always seems better than what we have now. I'm not romantic at all. Not at all. But I do know one thing. Somehow or another, in those days, you could be with yourself a little bit easier. 
you could be with yourself a little bit easier. It was much easier to escape, to disappear out there. You didn't have this pest called the phone. You didn't have this cyberspace. It's all over the place, <laughs> connecting into the head and pulling you here and pulling you there. You could be a little more focused. So I traveled the world for nearly five years. And if I remember correctly, when I was in Africa, for 10 months, I didn't even pick up a phone to call my father. I think that was a good thing. Anyway, I worked on this project for five years. We have some of the pictures here at the show. You see that? That comes out later again. That relates back to that, which relates back to that, which relates back to that. So the brain was there already. The mindset was there, even though perhaps I wasn't conscious of it. As I said, where did that start? blown up boy. You see these things in the background here. Somehow or another, if you look at the animal world, like you see if you go around the, into the jungle or in the bush and you watch the insects or the birds and you watch something like a white moth, do you know where a white moth goes, a white bug goes during the day? They go to something white. They know what attracts them. That's the thing, to find the thing that attracts you. I see this stuff again. This is in the show. In 1982, after doing a doctorate degree in geology, I ended up in South Africa again. Because I had gone to South Africa when I hitchhiked across Africa. Then I came back to South Africa in 1982. I've been there ever since. I guess if my arithmetic is right, I've been there 31 years. During this time, I started to wander around the countryside. I was a geologist and a photographer. People often ask me, what's the similarity? Well. There are, there, there are many similarities, there are many differences. But from a metaphoric point of view, what was my job? My job was to the peer inside as a geologist to see into the earth. And in photography, it became a job to peer into the mind, to go into the interior of the place. What happened? Well, previously, the coming to South Africa, all my photographs you saw in the boyhood book, all the pictures were outside. Then one day, in this place, it's called Hopetown. It's a place called Hopetown. Funnily enough, what did I do? Knock, knock, knock. The door opened. Yes, Meneer, what do you want? Yeah, my name's Roger. Can I come inside? Yes, Meneer, come inside, have some tea. Would you like some tea with me? Yes, I would. Thank you very much, sir. That was it. I went inside. 
and never went outside again. I stayed inside in every way. What did I find? Believe it or not, and this is the truth, this was in that house. This was the first wire picture I took. Bedroom of railway worker. There were times, just like the river during the flood, you see sometimes what the flood does when the river comes over one side and then the movement of the current takes you to the other side as the river winds and then the flood takes you to the other side. There were times when I got to the other side and then I didn't know where I was. I found another zone in this place. I hadn't been there before. I found another zone. There are pictures I took like this that I really couldn't explain. I couldn't find the word. I couldn't find the meaning. I knew I had found something. I knew I had found something. I got pushed to that zone. And then the river pulled me back and left me on the other side again. But I had been there now. I knew that other place. I established my territory. Here are some of the motifs that I found in these places that would come back again. This was one of the early pictures I took in the Dorp series. You know, it sort of comes from the boy series. There's a still a sense of romanticism in this, in this photograph. It's a famous photograph, but it was early in the series. And then there was this. There was that and the shadow behind it. In 1986, I started another project. This was the longest of my projects. It was about eight years. Part of the reason was that I was doing a lot of other work. And it was always hard to get into the countryside and I had other work to do. It was also a period in South African history of destabilization. It was a sort of a war going on a period of insecurity, a potential breakdown. And during this time, I photographed a bunch of white people, white people living on the margin, a forgotten group of people, of people that the white people, that, that the whites in power, the apartheid government, wanted to forget about. I opened a can, as they say, uh, I opened a scar, I opened a wound. It was a very difficult period for me when this book came out. I had death threats, I got arrested. Everybody ran. <coughs> Everybody ran away from Mr. Ballin except for one thing, my border collie Leroy. Everybody else ran. <coughs> people commonly ask, where do you find these people? That's a very common question. Well, firstly, I'll find, give me five minutes on the street here, I'll find somebody. So now I have somebody, what to do? What do you do?
That's easy. Find people. Who cares? What are you going to do with them? First, I found this. That was in the backyard as I drove past the house. Then Mr. DeBron, Sergeant DeBron, was sitting on the front. And I got out of my car. Hello, sir. Hello, how are you? Where have you been? I just came back from the prison. Yeah, what do you do in the prison? I work as a security guard. Yeah, you like your work? Yeah. Meneer, every day. Every day, Meneer, I come back with blood on my hands. Yeah, do you? Meneer. Can you? Can I do a favor? Can I? Can I? Can you do me a favor? Yes, of course. Can I take your photograph? Of course. I remembered this. Can we go to the back? Yeah, no problem. That's where the picture comes together. You see. You see him, you see her, that wasn't allowed, that was fine, you could be in prison, you weren't allowed to live with people of the opposite sex. This man kept having sex or relationship with his maids. He was lucky because his father was the mayor of the city, so they didn't arrest him, they just moved him out further out of town. So I saw him one other place, and he had another woman here, another black woman. And then they heard about that, and they moved them out again. You see that? You see that? Well, you see that, I'm sure. I'm sure you all see this. You recognize this, these two. Dressy and Cussy. You recognize them in your night, in the night. You carry them around with you all the time. They're in you. They're in you whether you've seen this picture or you haven't seen this picture. They're in you. They're in you. They're part of your makeup. I know you don't like that. You don't like hearing that. They're part of you. Where did you come from? Where did the species come from? It didn't come from angels. No, it didn't come from angels. children from countryside and city home, wife of abattoir worker. Man shaving on veranda. That's one of my favorite pictures from this series. Uh, Outland. In 1994-95, as I mentioned, I finished Platteland. And then things shifted very, very dramatically, very dramatically. Firstly, I stopped going to the countryside. I didn't go to the countryside anymore and haven't been to the countryside to take pictures since 1994. Roger Ballin stopped going to the countryside. All Roger Ballin's photographs since 1994 have been more or less in the Johannesburg area of South Africa. 
And then things started to happen differently with these people and the places. A sense of theater started to happen. Puppy between feet. What happened here? I got a macro lens and I didn't realize that actually, I, I use a Roloflex um, analog camera since 1982, and I still use it. I don't use digital cameras. I just use, I use film. And I have the same roller flex basically for the last 30 years. And I found the macro lens in 1999, and this was the first picture I took with that macro lens. It's a very famous photograph. Man holding cat. Now, Nobody's been able to answer this question in my career, I have to tell you. See, we see this. We see that. Good relationship. Good, 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 good. But what about that? See, you take that away, you lose a dimension to the picture. What is the relationship of this flower to this, to that? I've always said, and I'll say again, that the best pictures leave you in silence. You can't get to that. And if you think you're going to get to it, you won't. Brian and the pet pig. See, that looks, how'd that get here? That looks like a pig, doesn't it? <laughs> Cat catcher. I'll tell you quite an interesting story, because I see this man all the time. He uh, works near where I take pictures in a lot of times. I see him walking up this road, and he always has a bag. You know, something called canvas burlap. It's a brown woven bag. And he's always walking on the street, sometimes like this. I always stop. People always ask me, do the people, do you take pictures and run? I don't run. I'll look anybody in the eye and tell you I don't run. I know the people I work with. I'm good to the people I work with. The people I work with like me. We're friends. So I stopped. This must have been oh, three weeks ago. I stopped. How are you? I'm fine, Minear. Can you take me? Yeah, I'll take you. I'm a little bit busy, but I'll take you. Get in the car. Get in the car. Well, I have a car, you know, it's like a seat's in the front, and then there's an open back. It's called the Bucky in South Africa. I go in the back. Why? what was in the bag, these things. What was this man doing? See that word, cat catcher. Where did I take him? There's a place in downtown Johannesburg. It's where the witch doctors work. So I know where they go. And I've been down there 20 times already. So he takes the cats and they're scratching and they're screaming in the bag. So he pulls the bag out of the car. Goes inside the witch doctor's house and puts it on the scale. I think it was something like 30 kilograms, something like this, 28, 30 kilograms. And he got the money. I usually go out just in curiosity's sake to the back of the house. What's in the back of the house? 
washing lines. Washing line one, cat tails. What's in line two? Cat ears. What's in line three? The body of the cat. Woman, man, and dog. I really am a great believer in the decisive moment in photography. You'll see that my pictures are becoming, have become more and more abstract over the years. But I still am a great believer in the moment. I think photography is at its very best, in my opinion. Everything I say tonight is in my opinion. And that's where it happens. Here's another one. People endlessly, 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 endlessly say, did you stage the picture? Yeah, I did. I I trained this cat, you see. <laughs> see, I told the cat, every time somebody pulls you by the tail, you have to make your arms look like being up here. <laughs> see, there's a thing. Somebody asked me a few times, what do you mean by... St I say, am I... Staged means that you can repeat it again. Well, you know I was only teasing you. It's not possible again. Eugene on the phone. Rats on kitchen table. See, the big ones are a little easier. These small ones are hard to photograph. Uh, what's this one's called? A uh, living room scene. Head below wires. So these pictures, there was an interaction between me and the subjects, the subjects and me. I don't know what. The head goes here, the head goes here, the ears go here. This form is equal to that form. And these little things coming down here are repeated down here. So I'm very obsessive, formalistic photographer. I don't take pictures until everything is like a integrated, like an organic body. I don't take pictures until it's a unity. I'm obsessed with formalism. And you won't find very many of my pictures, even if you look at the early ones, where there's anything formally wrong with the picture. John. That's John. John. John got caught up in Angola in the late 70s. If you don't remember, there was a war going on in Angola between the Americans, the Russians, the Cubans, and the South Africans. Poor John, like a lot of poor men, got sent to the war zone for whatever reason, usually a bad reason. We all know that. But the gun rules. We know wherever we go, whether it's in Africa, whether it's here, wherever it is, behind everything is a gun. That's what really rules. Take the wrong step and the guns come out. It's a big pretense to think anything else. Poor John. He got stuck up in Angola. In a shell. John was never the same. John ended up in this place outside of Johannesburg in a little small farm plot. We'll put him here. And he was staying with these two men next to each other. So it was a tiny little room. Tiny little room. 
maybe from here to here. And there were three beds, bed one, bed two, bed three. This man was from Lesotho. One day he was dead in his bed. He was dead in his bed. There were only these two left. Two and a half weeks later, this man from Swaziland, he was dead in his bed. John, John stopped eating and drinking for 13 days. 13 days. He wouldn't eat. He wouldn't drink. Nobody cared. Nobody did anything about it. John died in his bed too. Scrap metal worker holding globe. He's far from being an atlas, you know, an art. It's usually this way. This was the, in the Outland series, this was the only still life, if you want to call it a still life, that I took. Um, it was in a person's bedroom, a boy, young boy's bedroom. How can you tell that? Well, your eyes probably aren't so good. Jerry, Bubby, or Zero, I can't remember these. See, if you're, I asked somebody, but he, he can't read it. I said, how good is your history? Tell me what rock group these four girls come through. One is married to the most famous football player, ex-football player in the whole world. Who is this group? Now you know it's a young boy or girl. Spice Girls. <laughs> Tommy Sampson in a mask. See the forms. They were living in together in this some place, some schoolroom. Towards the end of Outland, I started to integrate the drawing. Start drawing started to appear in my work about 2000 or so. There was still portraiture. And this period I call the transition period. It's when the drawing started to appear, yet there was still portraiture. Well-behaved cat. Cats are tough. Cats don't like being photographed. <laughs> Cats don't listen. Cats get a fright with the flash. Cats scratch and bite when you go near them. So when you get pictures like that, you have to be very pleased. <laughs> Shadow chamber. In about 2000 or so, I found a building near Johannesburg. It was a building near gold dumps. S Johannesburg area has produced nearly 50% of the entire gold production in the history of the earth. So it's the center of the world's gold industry for many, many years, for last century. And I found this building there. It was a three-story building with little rooms, and I, that's why I call it chambers. And I worked in this place for say, four or five years making these photographs. This was the cover to the Shadow Chamber uh, book. See, sometimes people always again ask me, well, where do you find the subjects? Do they like the picture? Do you give them the picture? What do they think about it? Do they cry or do they laugh? You know, but in this picture, look, this is one of my most famous pictures, and I took that picture within 15 minutes of meeting this person. So it doesn't really help that much to like the talk. I talk to the people, but the, the camera doesn't listen to the talk. The camera's like, the camera doesn't have any ears on it. It's like, it's a, it's a visual instrument. So 
You can get to know people, but it really doesn't help you that much. You still got to figure out what to do with them or how to work the visual issues. Like, so during this uh, period, the picture started to go more abstract. So you can see there's an active sculpture here, a little bit of drawing, and the photography is when the head goes inside, head inside shirt. Man, uh, crawling man. So where's the moment here? Let's see how clever you are here. Where's the moment? Where's the moment? You see the eye. You can't see it too well. If the print was here, you could see it. It's when the eye, the shape of the eye starts to look like these things. You can see it already here. That works here, but the eye is actually shaped like this. So it's when the thing gets consolidated that way. That's the moment. Look at these moments. Moment here, moment there, moment here, moment there, moment there. You see all these forms coming together, another one there. So like eight or nine forms just coming together in this picture called Bitten. It's one of my first bird pictures. Another bird picture, broken bag. So now this is the transition period where there's drawing and portraiture. Ooh. Ooh, we don't like this one. Now, from a formal point of view, you see that. It's like that. It's just like that. And this is a cross like that. And you see, what do you spell? If you take God in, uh, in English and uh, go this way, what does it mean? Dog. Now, I know I'm on touchy subjects, so I can't say more wars and more problems have been caused by religion than anything else, so I stay out of religion. <laughs> but you know, you know, you know inside that this is saying something. You know that. It's provoking, it's Pricking you a little. Good, good, good. Ouch. <laughs> good. That's what the work's supposed to do. You're not supposed to fall asleep or say, ooh, I saw that all before. Mm -mm. See, this is transition period again. Drawings, person, portraiture. This is also a transition period. The picture's there. Room in the Ninja Turtles. You see that? Uh, video over there. Uh, I think you freaky. The most important, I think for Don, or the most important thing that ever happened to them, maybe, was that they saw this photograph. This like photograph transformed them in all sorts of ways. And you, this is the, in the beginning. This is the this was the emblem of this was this that they always wore and identified with of these this these um, drawings that I made. Skew mask. Poor, poor puppy. Mm. I don't know how much time I have, so I better not tell you that story. That's a bad one. Mm. Uh, this is the only outdoor picture in Shadow Chamber called Hanging Pig. Rat Cemetery. <laughs> Ooh, here's another one. Mr. Rat. That's, I have said, uh, I stick my ground to this one. The most underestimated animal on the planet is Mr. Rat. Mr. Rat's everywhere. Survived the atomic bomb, he'll, he'll be everywhere. He can eat anything. He's smart, he's cunning, he breeds, they're everywhere. The rat man, he had about a couple hundred rats in his house. This is pictures, a later picture in this series and you can see it's becoming more surrealistic and you can see the, 
form here with that form, with this form, with that form. It's one of the first more surrealistic photographs I took. Here's another surrealistic one, a little bit earlier one, called Lunchtime. Roar. You see, uh, this again is transition photograph between the drawing and the portraiture. That that's in 2002, so that's during the transition period. Ooh. You see this. See, he was a pest. A, a quick story. This one here was a pest in the shadow chamber building. He made a lot of noise. He used to bang on people's doors at night. The, the mother couldn't control the child. So I, I had a friend who worked at the prison's department. And they were going to actually kill this kid, I think. He would have probably been stabbed or killed or something. I don't know. what he was. In, they didn't like him. I thought, well, I knew the mother. I liked him in a way. So I took the mother down to get some advice what to do with the child. So I knew this nice man who worked in the prison. He said, uh, take this thing. Do you know what this is? It's like called a ball and a chain. So they, I took it back. And then the mother put this thing on the boy's foot during the night so he couldn't run around the building irritating people. This was uh, one of the first photographs I took that combined painting, drawing, sculpture, because he's like sculptural, and photography, the moment when his arms become like the goose. So this is one of my most important pictures in that series, wall shadows. See that? That's even harder to catch than a cat. Mr. Roach doesn't like to hang around during the day, and he runs fast, and he hides. So that, I was very proud. That's one of the few insect shots I've gotten over the years. Kitchen counter. There are plenty of roaches in this place. Plenty, 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 plenty. Woo. And where's the magic moment here? Let's see how good you are here. Where's the moment? Nobody's ever gotten this one. And if you get it, it's because you've been to one of my lectures. <laughs> it's when the eye goes black. Then you don't know whether he's dead or alive, you see. It's the ambiguity. Ambiguous. Ambiguity. Funeral rites. This boy was running around pretending he was a cat. It's called prowling. Quite a beautiful formalistic photograph. In 2004, I had just uh, been to Russia. And then I um, came back to this place. And this was, there was, it was torn down. They tore it down. Um, and this was the door that I used to go in and out of the building, this door here. And um, what they did, it was, just, it was owned by a mining company. I think it was Anglo-American. So they uh, tore it down. And, and as modern life would be predictable, they built these awful plastic, shallow, horrible condominiums. What's left? That's an important question. It didn't occur to me before. What is left? Just the photographs. That's all. Boarding house. From 2004 to 2008, I worked in another building, another place. There used to be a warehouse for the mines. It was like bigger than this space, this building here, bigger. And people uh, divided these spaces with um, tin, with wood, with sheets, and lived in this uh, building. So I call it the boarding house. And people moved into this place. In South Africa, they call it squatting. And nobody owned the building. It was just an empty building. And they made a, a, a life here. And I worked in this place, as I said, for four or five years. See that eye there? See that? See that?
girl in white dress. Oh, I forgot that. Hmm, I shouldn't forget this. See, wow, this is a hard one. This is the most difficult question outside of how did the universe form for the average person. You see, you see what that says. I see it, I don't know if you can read it. That says me. So, how would you define who you are? You walk around all day and you think of yourself in some strange ways. But who is me? What's happening to me? Why am I me? What is it about me? What's going on with me? How can I define me? Is the way I define me, me? That's a real tricky one. Is the way I define me, me? So that's what it's all about, you see. That's what photography for me, Mr. Ballin sitting here, is all about. It's to define me. That's all. Nothing more, nothing less. Nothing more, nothing less. That's all, period. And somebody got murdered here that night. This was a New Year's party. It wasn't a happy night. Right on the floor here with blood, knife. Mr. Cat. You see the forms here. That form, that form, that there with that. Mr. Rat again. Celebration. He's celebrating. He's happy. Another one. This one is called um, Cut Loose. It's in the over there. But see, it works because of that. See, it makes sense because that's there. Without that, there's no picture again. There has to be a logic, a narrative. The picture actually has to make some sense to the mind. There has to be a beginning and an end. Not just a beginning and no end. There has to be a completion in the picture. Ouch. Bite. He had to go to the hospital. He thought he was so smart. My assistant had to take him. He got bitten. And what about this up here? What's that all about? Sleeping on the floor. Look at this with that. That ear with that up there. Most of these people in this place, and there were every mixture of blacks, whites, this and that, but most of the people during the day or night did this security work. So they would, if they worked at night, they would try to find a quiet place, and this guy found a quiet place in this, this thing. And somebody put him in here. Mr. Ballin was there to catch it. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is sculpture, painting, photography, when this relates back to that, the moment. Clear, simple, precise, complex. Uh, scavenging. He's like, I should have called this squirming. So this child... The mom, this was like a witch doctor's place behind here. The mother was sitting in there with the witch doctor. You know when you're in a witch doctor's house, it's like they have jars of stuff and they're bright color stuff, bright color powders, really bright, pink, purple, blue, bright, 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 and the people like mix these stuff up, the powders with the plants and drink it. Usually get sick. The baby couldn't stand it in there, worming his way out. And the retreat. Pathos. Now the guy who ran the boarding house, his name was Durkee. Durkee uh, was hardly, was blind almost. He had these big cataracts in his eyes. 
And he was like this size. And this was in front of his room. Nobody, nobody in the four or five years ever went near this thing. Nobody. This man was obsessed with 9-11. Every time he saw me, he went, 9-11, 9-11, 9-11. He slept on this place. Squawk. You see the forms up here, that form with that form, with that form, with that form, these forms here with that form. Squawk, squawk. That's uh, sliced. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. That's how the animal survives. The bird grabs its tail, the tail falls off, the lizard runs away, and the tail goes back. Nobody got harmed in this one. You see him. We don't know what's going on up there. Who, what type of place is this? But what's he doing? See, I was watching him. I was watching him when he was over here. I had an idea that he would end up here. I wasn't sure. But how did I have an idea that he might end up here? Let's see, I'll, let's see if you can get that one. How did I predict that one? Spare ribs? Chicken. What dog wouldn't go after spare ribs and chicken? So I knew he'd be around there. And I was waiting. <laughs> Washing line. Uh, one of the last ones here. Washing line. What went on in this room? This room, I counted, I think about 24 cats and about 10 dogs in a room about this big. This room kept these, and this woman kept going around the, house, the boarding house and trying to find these wires. And then the way I took this picture was this. I got in, I couldn't go inside, I didn't really want to go inside. This was against the wall. So you had to hold your breath. I got, Phew. So you couldn't go in that room. Can you imagine like all those animals that never go out of the room? So like the animals got these diseases, or I don't know if it's a disease, but scurvy or something like the the um the fur like was falling out. So like the dogs and the cats had like patches like my head, you see? Got a little hair here. And like there's a spot here. You see the spot. But like that's what happened to the animals, like the hair fell off. Like mine. So mine took longer though. <laughs> These ended up here on his honeymoon and they ended up in this place. Three three brothers. They kept following each other to the bathroom, to the kitchen, back to the bed. There were three brothers here. One, two, three. And the pet chicken. <laughs> Terrorized. What do you think he's scared of? Right there. He's heading somewhere out of there. <laughs> he doesn't like him. This is not a nice place. I'm telling you, this is a very rough, difficult, complicated, hard, brutal place. That's what I can tell you that. And humanity comes through in every level that you might think. There's no escaping humanity in this place. This one's called Predators. The boss, Durkee, said every window had to be covered. You weren't allowed to look out the window. Every window had to be covered. So this was one window. This was his pet rooster. This one's called concealed. You see the little cat here. You know, see the forms again. This form with that form with that form with 
that form over there with that form. So this has got about nine forms that come together and faster than you can blink. Another security guard. See the tooth and the nose with related back to this again. He was tired sleeping during the day. This friend was sleeping up here. He ended up in the basement. He tried to steal somebody's TV and ended up in this place. This, uh, I have an assistant. I had an assistant. Uh, she worked with me for 12, 13 years. Uh, but this young man was also sort of my assistant. He was a nice young man. I think he was about 15 or so. He was very helpful. Mr. Ballin, can I get you a Coke? Yeah, of course. Mr. Ballin, can I help you with the bag? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Ballin, can I go out and see whether somebody's going to break into your car? Yeah, of course you better, but be careful. Be careful. Don't get involved. Okay. Then through the rumors, I had heard here and there that they wanted to get rid of him, that they wanted him to leave. I don't ask too many questions. You've got to stay out of things. I have that I know where my line is. You don't survive in a place like this for five years if you don't know where your line is. That's important in photography. You gotta know where your line is. You know, you're, you're bringing in somewhat of an aggressive tool into a place with a camera. So you gotta know where the line is. Anyway, unfortunately, unfortunately, this boy heard that he was going to be ki uh, moved out, be taken out, forced out, and he committed suicide. There was another place like this up the road. It got very, it was like a wealthy mission. It became a religious mission. The guy was able to raise a lot of money through the church, through private sponsors, through corporations to support the poor. He didn't like this place up the street. Two things happened. One. Just before this happened, it was very funny by coincidence. I drove past his place. And guess what he was driving? You'll never guess. A red Ferrari. <laughs> anyway, what, do you, what does it mean if somebody has a red Ferrari? It's usually you have a lot of money. What does money bring? Money brings power. I don't care whether you're in Africa or whether you're in Austria or whether you're in Timbuktu. Money's power. Brings things. He paid the police. I know that. To destroy the place. To kick everybody out. And that's the end of the boarding house. In the show here today, we have some of my latest work called Asylum. Asylum I've been working on for about five years now. Every picture in the Asylum series has a bird in it, every one of it. You can see up there, I would suggest, if you can, you can go see the installation I made up there. And it, on the right-hand side, that right-hand side, is some of the later pictures from the Asylum series. So I've been working uh, with birds in a particular place near Johannesburg for the last five years, and the book will be published at the end of the year, early next year. But this is one of the pictures that's over here. And you can see in these pictures, there's a lot more drawing, and there's very few portraitures anymore. I mean, I didn't really, I forgot to tell you that 
In about 2003, 2004, the face really disappeared from my pictures. So for the last 10 years, you don't find many faces. Here's the feather, here's the bird. <laughs> the abstract, more abstract piece. And the pictures have become more abstract in their own ways. So what's happening here? See now, good, good, sort of an interesting example. Why does this bird belong on this head? See, and the mind thinks this way. You may not figure this out. Why does the bird belong on the head like this? Well, where do birds come from? Shells. This looks like a broken shell. The bird likes to be there. He feels at home. So that's a hand, by the way. That's called headless. That was an early picture. Early picture um, in this series. Another one. Whoops. Well, it doesn't matter. This one's called Nine Birds. You can count them, the nine birds, and a flying one. This is a real tough shot. And birds are not easy either, I can tell you that. This is not easy work. This is very, very difficult work. It takes a lot of concentration, a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of <sighs> concentration. It just, we really have to be focused. It's really hard to make these pictures. I wouldn't, don't, oh yeah, push the button, that's easy, that's photography. No, 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 it's just really hard to get these pictures right. You know, think of getting nine birds right, and they're not sitting there, they're moving all the time, they don't want to sit there either. Another bird, this is over here, I think, also. See, there's a lot of new drawings, and there's the bird. And there's a relationship here, this is the most important thing in the picture here. Sort of mirrors the bird. Here's another one. Here's a tough shot. Uh, duck. These are all live animals, by the way. Rat, duck, rat, bird, 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 rat, 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 rat. That's a tough shot. Look at Mr. Rat here. Look at Mr. Rat here. And look at Mr. Duck here. What's going on in this place? Figure it out. Good luck. <laughs> Oh, well, this is the last one. All good things have to come to an end. I commonly say, if you've seen some of my lectures, I think this is the best way to explain things. Because I, I don't like always saying the same thing all the time, but I have to bring this up. I commonly hear, whether I'm here, I know that's English, here, here, that's, that's why my English language is so difficult. People commonly tell me, oh, Mr. Ballin, your pictures are so distressing to me. Oh, Mr. Ballin, those pictures are dark. Oh, Mr. Ballin, don't you feel sorry? Oh, Mr. Ballin, these pictures make me nervous. I commonly say, I'm very pleased about this. Very, very, very pleased. It means that the pictures have entered you. They've gone into another realm that you haven't been before or you're very scared to enter. They've penetrated into the place that you've tried to avoid. Just remember, and don't forget, the light comes from the dark. Thank you. I don't know what the timing is here. I'm happy to answer a few questions, I guess. I don't know what the...
Roger, were you able, uh, all the people you photographed in South Africa on, in the countryside, were you able to com communicate with everybody in English? Uh, were there many, many, some people or many people who were not able to understand even a word of English? Yeah. Um, generally speaking, like in Austria, like in anywhere in the world you go, even countries like, I don't know, where they never even knew any English language, it's, uh, the English language just pervades everywhere you go now. And English is always more or less the first language in South Africa. So in the early days, it was a little more difficult to get along with English, but still people understood English. These days, everybody understands English. It's the first language in South Africa, and even uneducated people speak English. Sorry? No, yeah, 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 yeah. They may not, they may, look, they're not speaking English the way I speak English, but they, their English yeah. is there. Because we met people in the countryside who didn't understand even a word of English, only Afrikaans. That's why I asked. Yeah, no, I, th I think, you know, the, this, um, this could be true, especially maybe of the uh, elderly people, but uh, certainly not of the younger generation. It's, uh, if you go to any school, you have to learn English. You can't graduate without learning English. And the, but the TV and everything else, computerization, it's just more pervasive. Roger, you did this installation upstairs yeah. and these drawings on the floor here. Uh, when did you start making drawings by yourself? My drawings uh, started uh, when I went to certain people's houses. So if you can see an outline over there and of the, some of the pictures that I showed you, um, I confronted or found drawings in people's houses. The young people especially in some of these houses were allowed to draw all over the walls. And so I placed um, some of the subjects next to the drawings. And then I started to begin to see the relationship of drawings to subjects. And this started to get extended, extended, extended. And somewhere um, during the early shadow chamber period, I actually started to make drawings. And people commonly asked, are the drawings mine? Or are they the subjects? Or are the people in the place? Well, they're all three. Some of the pictures have only my drawing. Some of them have a mixture. Some of them are not mine. So each picture is a little different. Um, oops, yeah, that's loud. Uh, my question would be, um, you said you don't stage a picture, which in the end you do. Um, okay, so if there is a picture you staged and then you put a picture next to it, what you did not stage, which is pure coincidence in a certain way, wh what do you feel, what's the difference? Do you understand? Yeah. I think for me, and again, it's my definition, because for me, in my way of viewing things, a staged picture is that one that can be repeated exactly in nearly every way. It means it can be done over. It's not almost spontaneous. It didn't occur in such a situation when you look at a picture, um, it could, that you could conceive of, that you could actually make that same picture. And so, you know, if I took the bird away, then you could call this an installation, a staged installation. But uh, the bird is a very important thing in the photograph. And so the bird transforms the installation in its own way through the moment. And so, yes, you could say, oh, well, you can put the bird in some other way. Well, that's fine, but I can't get the bird again like that. 
So it's a very fine line, and it depends on how you define the word. But all I'm trying to say in very simplistic terms, because we could get into an endless philosophical questioning issue here, all I'm trying to say is this, this picture, the way it is, can't be re repeated exactly the way it is. That's, that's all I'm saying. I think it is not necessary to ask you any questions because it's all there. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's actually right. She's actually making a very good point. That's what I said earlier, you know, it's there. I'm not around after Sunday to answer any more questions. Got to look at the picture and uh, just react to the picture. Don't start to second guess whether I uh, went to the Salvation Army and got the people or whether I asked the wealthiest uh, people in South Africa to pose for me or whether I went into a, a studio or whether I went into a broken home to take the pictures. Forget all about that stuff. You'll never know. Look at the picture. Uh, sorry for asking you another question, but what was the problem with the face? You finished to picture the faces. What was the problem with it? Uh, uh, he's asking a good question. I like that. That's a good question. When the human being, or most human beings, look at a photograph that has a face in it, the first thing that they try to understand is the person in the picture. And they forget about everything else. So I have a lot of other things in my pictures and I'm very interested in form, I'm interested in objects, I'm interested in many other aspects of the visual language other than people's faces. And so when I pulled out the faces, the other things started to breathe and, come to into the, and, and, ca and came to be recognized. So I did what I wanted to do with the faces, and I moved on. And that's quite important as an artist, you know, uh, who wants to do the same thing over again. I'm not in this business to, to prove that I can do the same thing over and over again in the same way. I, I do this for myself. It's my own, my own journey. So there's no challenge to me to keep taking pictures of, in the same way. Uh, you move on. You progress. I, progr <laughs> I progressed. Excuse me, one more question. The bird, what is this for you? The bird. Yes. Is it, more, is it the solve of our problems in this world of war and so on? Thank well, you. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's interesting. You brought up a nice question, an interesting question. You know, uh, I uh, saw an exhibition uh, in Essen in Germany. It's about Paul Clay. Um, did these drawings in the 30s and the early, late 20s or something like that on, on angels. So the angel, what is the significance of the angel? Well, the significance of the angel in as a way, similar in a way I felt to the bird. You know, the linking. There are links between the heaven and the earth. And so maybe that's the symbol. I, I, I really, I wouldn't say that's the only thing either, you know. I can't say, I don't know. That's one idea. We could also say other ideas. See, I don't really like getting caught up in this idea of defining the work for you, and I can't define it for myself. I'm not really interested at all in what the meaning of the picture is. I can't tell you what the meaning of the picture is. Forget it. I can't. I don't know it. I don't know. I don't try. I don't even try. It's not worth it. It just goes around in my head with words that just make me dizzy get nowhere. So I forget about it. I don't think about well, what this picture means. It means what it means. You go outside and look at the snow. snow. What's the snow mean? Oh, it's snow. Roger Bellum, thank you very much. Mm, thank you.